welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping the world, inspiring the future, and for all those that like really great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your health, aging, and longevity ambassador, uh, along for the journey today. Uh, so as many people know that have been watching and listening to the show, we've been spending a lot of time in recent months on sort of uh, what I'll call the micro uh, issues around aging, uh, you know, talking about biology of aging, the genes, the proteins, uh, the, the cells, the, the disease processes. We haven't spent as much time on the macro issues. When I talk about macro, I mean the basic future that everyone pretty much agrees is coming in terms of this major demographic uh, shift that's going to be occurring as we enter this era of increased health spans and lifespans looking forward in the coming decades, and ultimately how, from a society perspective, we are going uh, to deal with you know, the big picture issues. Recently, uh, the World Health Organization, through their Department of Aging and Life course, uh, defined this new decade that we just entered, 2020, 2030, as the decade of healthy aging, uh, and see major opportunities to bring together all sorts of forces, governments, civil society, international agencies, professionals, academia, and so forth, for really the next 10 years of con you know, concerted thinking, collaborative action on how we ultimately improve the lives of older people, their families, and the communities they live in to deal with this major demographic shift. Uh, as part of this initiative, uh, the World Health Organization created the Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities, which ultimately represents a network of cities or communities that are committed to this inclusive uh, accessible uh, environment to benefit their aging populations and a growing number of cities uh, and communities worldwide are striving to meet the better needs of their older residents. Uh, that's what the World Health Organization established uh, this network to basically foster the exchange of information and experiences. Uh, cities and communities that have joined the network are of many different sizes, they're located in different parts of the world, uh, take place in different cultural and socioeconomic contexts, but ultimately they all have this desire and commitment to promote healthy and active aging for the populations. Just recently, uh, in December of 2019, uh, the country of Ireland became the first country in the world to become fully affiliated with the World Health Organization Global Network. And each of their 31 local governments now has led programs that have a so-called age-friendly strategy and committed to ensuring uh, the plan that WHO has set up for this more inclusive and supportive environment. Catherine McGuigan, uh, is National Program Lead for Age-Friendly Ireland, which is an organization whose goals is to pursue a vision that every county in Ireland would be a great place in which to grow old. Uh, the program is part of the World Health Organization movement, uh, and it basically aims to make sure that uh, the elderly have a say in what happens in their lives and communities, enjoy good health in their later years, access high quality services, and are ultimately engaged and have the ability to participate in, in everything that's going on in, in the cities, communities, counties, and so forth of Ireland. Uh, Ms. McGuigan is also uh, the chief officer of Meath County, uh, which is the primary unit of local government in the county of Meath. Um, and we'll, I'm really looking forward to talking to her all about everything that's going on in Ireland today. Uh, Catherine McGuigan, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. Good morning, Ira. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Delighted to be here. Absolutely. Um, you know, we typically start off the show by giving our guests uh, the floor for a bit just to talk about themselves. If you can introduce yourself, sort of your background, where you grew up, uh, sort of your, your path through local government, and ultimately uh, how you were given the responsibility for this uh, rather uh, you know, impressive program uh, and became the national program lead for Age Friendly Island. Okay, Ira. Well, um, I suppose for about the last 25 years, I've worked in the field. Um, largely with older people, private sector, NGO, third sector, and now the local government sector. Um, I suppose I've had the pleasure of working with older people and understanding the real uh, challenges, um, issues, but also the opportunities. And, and one of the things we started when we started the Age Friendly Programme was that we talked about bounty and not burden and tried to change a little bit of the narrative because um, stereotyping is, is, is one of the really bad downsides and ageism is actually probably one of the most um, acceptable forms of stereotype that still exists um, in society today and I, I think really one of the things that we set out to do when we started the program uh, which is about 10 years now and I suppose I'll, I'll just clarify I'm, I'm the Chief Officer of Age Friendly Ireland which is effectively 
a shared service within the local government hosting. Um, the Chief Executive Officer of Meath County Council, there are 31 administrative areas in, in Ireland and there are 31 Chief Executive Officer, Chief okay. Executives, uh, formerly called County Managers. And they are designated, I suppose, the Chiefs of ruling out all aspects of local government. So in local government, we're responsible for about over 100 services, roads, infrastructure, public services, uh, housing, planning, mm -hmm. community services, participation, sports, all of those areas. So it's quite a big brief at local government level. And there's about probably 30,000 employees across the country um, in those 31 administrative areas. And there are 31 chief executives. And I really, you know, I have to commend that they have been shown fantastic leadership and backbone um, in terms of delivering this program over the last 10 years. So maybe if I take it back a little bit, Ira, in terms Absolutely. of where we started. Absolutely. Uh, the World Health Organization did their study around 2006, 2007, the framework that you talked about. And they went out to 33 cities across the world. And, and it was really, I noted that you had done a lot of research in terms of the mix that you know, they went across different countries that were different stages of development and uh, looked at all the different diversities that exist in terms of economic and social challenges and, and I suppose different levels of income and, and really to explore what those challenges were on a global basis. So they developed the framework and the checklist. There was eight thematic areas and really said to countries, this is what you need to consider and this is what you need to get to. Mm -hmm. So in an Irish context, um, the Aging Well Network were a kind of a think tank that had developed in Ireland, very strategic leaders, philanthropically funded, to look at what we need to do in terms of looking at this agenda on aging. Not only was there going to be population growth, but demographic change and what we needed to do to respond to that. And it was really out of that think tank that the Age Friendly Cities and Counties program was born. And one of the first administrative areas, which was actually Louth County Council, the chief executive there decided to, you know, that, well, I'm going to start this process. And he adopted it and um, looked at a methodology that we could de develop in that administrative area that could potentially be rolled out across the 31. So that's where I came in 10 years ago to start facilitating that process. And basically, that methodology was de developed and rolled out across the 31 areas. And what it entailed was the allocation of a resource in-house, um, which was a senior role within local government to take responsibility for driving this. And it was really important that the, the ethos of collaboration was, you know, throughout. This was not a local government project that would be mm -hmm. delivered. It was that everybody needed to be involved. The private sector, the public sector, the academics, the, you know, the third sector, the NGO sector, but most importantly, Ira, the citizen. Mm -hmm. For the first time, they decided, you know, historically and probably in every country, a lot of institutions work in silos. You know, they're responsive sure. and say, this is my budget and this is what I'll do. So apart from creating an environment where agencies would talk to each other and say, what could we do better? They decided to be informed by the citizen. And that was a very pragmatic approach in terms of going out and asking older people. We also adopted, uh, I suppose, um, Glenn Miller's approach that it wasn't just, you know, looking at older people, people with disabilities. We agreed with him that when you, when you speak to a younger person, you exclude other groups. But if you speak to, speak to an older person, you've got a lifetime of experience there. And mm -hmm. whether it's issues with accessibility, different challenges that come at different stages in your life. You and I were joking a little earlier about children and the challenges mm -hmm. and high mortgages and university fees. And then when you're younger, those things aren't that important. And then as you get older, that's released and you may have a little more disposable income and in what you would like to do with that, or you might not. And I suppose the wealth of knowledge that came through with those people, coupled with the fact that they may have had illness and different challenges, it just meant that we had a broad span of uh, feedback yeah. that really would present all the challenges. So the first thing we did was we went out to consult and to date, we have consulted with over 20,000 older people across Ireland. They took the form of uh, different, um, you know, roundtables, one-to-ones, you know, questionnaires, surveys. And we've also conducted a national baseline as well, Ira, mm -hmm. with 11,500 older people, which was completed in 2018. Um, but I suppose the main thing was that we wanted to ask people on the th under the thematic areas, what's important to you? And there were four simple questions. What's good about where you live? What's not so good? What can the agencies and the, the providers do? 
and what can you do? What can you do to contribute? And out of that, I suppose, a strategy was born. There were structures that were set up, a very strategic age-friendly alliance, which was, I suppose, the most senior people from the different organizations, the health service, policing, education and training, development and partnership companies, transportation. So they were all brought in. And interestingly, that structure was chaired by the chief executive of each local authority or each administrative area. Okay. And what that meant was when that level of leadership was there and you had people coming in that had the brief for budgets and procurement and had the decision-making power, an awful lot, of, I suppose, of work could take place in that forum. We also set up an older persons council where it was a two-tier structure, a broad council, which could be anything from 100 to 300 people, and then an, an executive elect or committee members from around 16 to 24 people who would meet every six weeks to inform the strategy, but most importantly, to, to input to the strategy and the development of that. So the, one of our core principles, Ira, was that we didn't ask for any new money. Mm -hmm. So they didn't ask for a huge amount of money to do age-friendly housing or a vast amount of money to make age-friendly towns and put in you know, pedestrian crossings and bus stops, that we asked all the agencies to look at their existing budgets, who in essence, they all exist, and deliver them in an age-friendly way. Because we didn't want to create a mindset where age-friendly was going to be costly. Mm -hmm. We were just saying, if you create it and develop it universally with age-friendliness in mind, you're creating a better space for all. And we had some lovely slides to depict that where, you know, uh, one of my favorite one is it shows snow on the front of a building and there's the wheelchair ramp, accessible ramp, and then the steps. And the man is coming out and shoveling the, the snow off the steps. And somebody mm. said, well, if you just clear the ramp, everybody can get up. Right. And I think that was one of the, the things that we, you know, we always kept at the back, just deliver it in a way that everybody can access it. So. As I say, that, of course, there was a local budget to develop a strategy and hold the consultations. And that was a, a meager amount of money, I suppose, or a modest amount of money to be able to develop a strategy. And that's what happened. And they, the strategy was brought to the Alliance members. They agreed and said, yes, I'll commit to doing X, Y, and Z. The strategy was launched. And most importantly, Ira, it was implemented. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it sounds like such a huge journey, but from to the end of 2016, all the 31 programs went through that uh, stage and Age Friendly Ireland as an organization were there as a national organization to support and facilitate the development of that. And I had the pleasure throughout that process of actually individually supporting each of the counties or city areas to bring the programs to that stage. And it was remarkable and it was done very cost effectively. And to date, about 10,000 initiatives have rolled out and I'll talk to you a little bit later about the resources that we have because we really do provide a lot of technical guidance. Even that whole methodology is put together in a program handbook. And part of our commitments to WHO is, is being a, a sharer and you know, networking with other countries. And we would provide all those resources to give them guidance. And in terms of, I suppose one of my key phrases is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So if other mm -hmm. countries can look at what we did and said, well, don't go down and do it that way because that hasn't worked. You know, we really have, I suppose, critical success factors developed to be able to let other countries know what works. So I guess at the end of 2016, what happened really, I suppose, transitionally was um, the Age Friendly Ireland programme, the board decided that uh, at the end, when we had received some philanthropic funding from Atlantic Philanthropies to actually host the, sh the, the national organisation. So there was a decision then to be made, well, now... Does, what formation does that national role take? Because it's important to have that role there. Sure. And they decided through the reform program of 2014 to make it a shared service function of the local government. And through 2017 and 2018, it went through that process in Meath County Council, one of the local, uh, local government, lead local governments, you know, applied and bid to be that host. And that's how the Age Friendly Ireland moved into Meath County Council. But it's important to note that a shared service West, hosted by one lead, uh, local authority, is a service to all of the mm -hmm. local authorities. So it's servicing the whole of Ireland, and we have a number of staff in there to support the development. And we have, you know, four strategic high-level goals. You know, one of them is technical guidance and providing, you know, getting or local programs continuing to develop, continuing to implement, to look at other areas and replicate best practice if that's working well we will do it here and also to influence policy and provide that collective voice. So all of our structures have developed. So for example, one of the key things that's so important, as I said, is the, the 31 older people's councils 
So they meet nationally. The chairpersons of those meet at national level. And what we have there is, is if there are local issues that can't be resolved at local level administratively, that they have an opportunity to bring those up and voice them as more policy issues. So if I give you a nice example of that recently, um, there was one particular area in the West that's having uh, trouble with ambulatory services. Mm -hmm. And because they're, and we've been through a big period of austerity in Ireland, uh, sure. Ira, and we have to do more with less. And I suppose the program actually thrived in those areas because we were so creative and came up with very good solutions. But on that basis, we were able to go to the National Ambulance Service, bring them in to meet the National Older People's Councils. They were given a forum to raise their concerns. And the Older People's Councils are very much in a space where they speak collaboratively, they work in partnership. They're not in any way a lobbyist group or a group that comes in and says, this is wrong, this is wrong, what are you going to do about it? It's very much here, it's a co-design approach. Here are the problems. We think this might be a nice solution. What do you think of that? And they support the delivery of those. And that's probably what's so great about, about the program. And it's so great about, I suppose, the, the delivery of it because the older people have been a part of that delivery the whole way through. So I, I guess in terms of you know, what we've achieved, the, the ceremony that we had at the end of December. So our Taoiseach, which is effectively our, our Irish Prime Minister, came to launch um, the, the 31 uh, certificates that we received from the WHO. The WHO came over from Geneva and it was a very, um, I suppose, significant event for us in as much as that we were able to recognise the participation of everybody over the last 10 years that has helped deliver this. The people, the chief executives and local authorities, the people from the HSC on guard the Shikona, which is our national policing, our older people, external stakeholders, departments, government officials, ministers, all came together to say what we've done has been quite significant. And I suppose uh, the humility in me will always say, we're not the most age-friendly country in the world, you know, and we don't pretend to be. I'm sure there are plenty of challenges, particularly at the moment we have challenges in terms of healthcare and housing and lots of others. But instead of being a country that will be responsive um, and reactive to an, an impending uh, set of challenges sure. we, we feel we're very well informed and ready and prepared and we're making those government de departments um, informed at particularly a policy level that those challenges are available they are coming down the road and this is what we think and the, as I said Ira we have a whole sort of um, plethora of uh, really good practices that have rolled out some of them have been done in each of the areas and some of them have been escalated and scaled up nationally like age-friendly business age-friendly parking age-friendly housing developments age-friendly walkability audits age-friendly towns age-friendly airports age-friendly hospitals we've done quite a number of uh, you know i suppose one-off pilots where sure. we have then put into a methodology and shared them with others and they've taken them. And, the, you know, it's, it's quite good when you go out and you see, well, we did a walkability in this area. The engineer was involved. The local citizens were involved. Key stakeholders were involved. An action plan was developed around, you know, we need to put in a pedestrian crossing here. We need some age friendly parking there. We need an accessible ramp. And they're around the physical and built environment, but then other things about information hubs and opportunities for older people to socialize and network sure. and lots of wonderful initiatives come out. So we try to provide a repository, I suppose, or a compendium of initiatives to be able to inform, you know, other areas, what it is that they can do and a set of solutions, which, which we're very happy to share uh, uh, with all our, our global partners. So I suppose we've done quite a lot. And um, we're, we're happy with our achievements. And what we need to focus on now over the next 10 years is what is the next decade going to bring for us? It's, it's, an, it's an amazing set of, of things you've done and, uh, and, and the amount of time and with the budgets that you had, it's just, uh, it, it's startling. And I, I, I think there's a tremendous amount that uh, 200 other countries can learn from this. Um, before we go into uh, specific components that you're most excited mm -hmm. about and, 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 and we'll talk on, on that front. I just want to ask you a quick question because, you know, you talked about the, um, obviously, you know, you, you did this without the new money, uh, with, you did it with, within existing budgets. I mean, obviously I sit here on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean and in, in the United States and we obviously have a different population and a, and a different sort of structural setup to how this country runs, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, it's hard, <laughs> clearly an Arab, political system to get, you know, California to agree with what goes on in 
Arkansas and, and so forth. Could you talk just a little bit more about sort of the, uh, the process of bringing together these 31 counties? I mean, were there some surprises there? Were, was there any, uh, were there groups that said no at first that didn't want to be involved? I mean, what was that whole, I would call, you know, sort of, I think of the political battling between the states here, you know, was there, were there holdouts? Were there people that said, you know, no, aging is a stupid idea. <laughs> so what was the process like? It's, it's really mm -hmm. quite interesting. Uh, in, in I terms suppose of when translate. I spoke to you earlier, yeah, about our critical success factors, because oftentimes, particularly other countries come in and say, you know, how did you do that? And, you know, how did you get, you know, everybody on, on board? So there's a couple of ways I respond to that. First of all, everybody got this. It wasn't a hard sell, Ira. Mm -hmm. When we went out to speak to the leaders, particularly, everybody understood, you know, that everybody has a vested interest sure. because everybody's going to age. But also that I think they appreciated that we recognized your role is so important, whether you're a government official, whether you're a chief executive of a local authority, whether you're a citizen, whether you're in the third sector, you have the, the, the brief to help create change. Sure. And the other thing I think that really resonated with people, it wasn't necessarily about us, it's about our children sure. and about creating a sustainable environment. So when we went out, we, we really, it wasn't, you know, there were some that were sort of saying, well, you know, resources are very, very tight and we would have to, you know, put somebody on this. And, and I think that was, you know, nobody wanted to go and partake in it if they weren't willing to put the resources behind it. Mm -hmm. I think, Maybe one of the other things was there is a great camaraderie in our sectors in Ireland. So for example, the 31 local authority leaders, there's a lot of mutual respect. So if one started something and they said, you know, it would be great if your county or city undertook to do this, there's a lot of mutual respect for the lived experience. So they would say, absolutely, I'll, I'll try this. There's no, I don't think any kind of real uh, I suppose, competitive nature between them. They're very happy to learn. Local government works very well in that regard in Ireland. There's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of other agencies do too. But because they were the ones that were going to be the initial host, that worked very well. And we believe that uh, camaraderie and support for each other and, and respect for each other um, helped us to adopt the programme and roll it out. So um, a lot of it was going out and you know, explaining and, and delivering it with passion and saying mm -hmm. this, you know, this can be really, really important. But I think one of the key things was, I think that we were adamant that we shouldn't get huge injections of cash into it, that we would try to deliver it within the parameters of our own budgets. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying we need new budgets, we would say, let's reallocate or readjust our existing budgets to deliver them in an age friendly way. And um, whether that's around planning or housing or all those other areas, that if we can just build age friendliness into it. And I suppose when everybody's seen that, they said, this makes sense. It really, really makes sense. The other thing was working collaboratively together, can, breaking down the silos is so important in terms of getting things done. And so I have to say it was a mixture of just, you know, meetings and, you know, getting the message across, good presentations, good data. Mm -hmm. Being able to say that the WHO were behind this was significant as well. Sure. That they had done the research globally, that they had recognized that this was going to be a challenge and that we should be responsive. And I think, you know, when we went to all the different stakeholders, they said this absolutely makes sense. So, um, you know, I have to say in all earnest, we didn't get a huge amount of resistance. And if you went to an area and they said, we're maybe just not ready at the minute or we have a lot of other challenges in healthcare and different areas. We're not ready to undertake this. You know, between 2009 and 2016, they came on incrementally. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, it. sometimes it was, well, let's wait a year and see how that other program got on and learn from those. And, and some of the ones that come in at the latter part of that process, they learned an awful lot from the early uh, adopters they were able to get the benefit of that experience and say, right, we can fast track this process because we know how to do a good consultation. We know how to replicate best practice. We know what's important in terms of demographics in this part of the country or in this region. And we learn collectively from others. So I think that was part of the process that, you know, whole learning network was very, very important. So I, I guess that was one of the, the, the opportunities rather than a challenge. Sure. Everybody came on board and, you know, we just, and I suppose, Ira, what's really good is that's captured in the, in the program handbook. 
you know, how to encourage people to see the merit of this. And whether that's good data, whether it's evidence, whether it's the support of the WHO, leadership from, you know, comrades and partners, it all came together. And, and I think that's how we got through the process. Outstanding. Outstanding. Talk about, you know, obviously you, you gave a tremendous list of, of uh, all of the different, so you, you, you didn't, you only wanted to do a few of them, but uh, all of the different things that, uh, you know, when you went for a walk around a particular city or area that, uh, you know, we, we can look at the age-friendly parking, the, the hospitals, the, the recreation, so forth. Talk about some of the parts of the program, obviously there's so many, but talk about some of the ones you're, you're most excited about, you're most proud of. Uh, I mean, there's so much you've gotten done, but if you could just go into a few of those areas that um, just a, sure. in your opinion are the real successes that, uh, that you like to highlight in presentations? I suppose um, I, I'm doing a lot. One of the key ones that we're I'm really proud of or really happy with is that we, we did some, we did a lot of work over the last 10 years in terms of housing. And we know what the challenges are, um, you know, housing and health for a start off go hand in hand. Sure. And where you live impacts on how you live. And, you know, we have, I suppose, historically in Ireland, we found that people transitioned um, into residential care, long-term residential care, almost prematurely because mm. facilities at home or supports at home weren't available. Sure. So these were a lot of the challenges we got in the early days. And, uh, you know, at local level, there were things addressed in terms of linking up with good rural transportation programs to be able to get people to hospital appointments following a critical incident. Mm -hmm. Or it might be working with pharmacies through the age friendly business, uh, business to do blister packs or home deliveries. The simplest things, Ira, that were able to enable older people to continue living independently were discovered through this process. And I suppose then we moved into the greater challenges about the design of your home and applying universal design principles and mm -hmm. working with partners in the National Disability Authority to look at those universal design principles because in Ireland we have a thing called Part M which is mandated disability access and you know it's how you get into your home but there are so sure. many other things and we learned about the simple challenges like you know door saddles and you know trip hazards and not being able to get upstairs to use your bathroom anymore and retrospectively having to fit your home to be able to make it adoptable when you'd already had the critical incidents were presenting huge, huge challenges for older people. So basically, we started to work very, very closely with the health services and, the, and our local authorities to look at design and age-friendly housing. And we mm. did some research in 2016 and recognized then it wasn't just your bricks and mortar and the design of your home. It was the location. It was the place making, the proximity to services, okay. the engagement with your neighbors and your friends and how important that was to people. And, you know, gated communities, segregating older people was not the way to go. So a few things happened with all that research and all those, you know, intermittently across the country, a lot of the program areas were doing small things that would fill gaps, for example, like provision of meals on wheels in the home when somebody wasn't able sure. to get out. Lots and lots of initiatives happened. But I suppose at policy level, there were a few key cha changes. The National Planning Framework was then developed in 2017 to replace our previous uh, spatial framework. And it recognized um, a few key principles in terms of sustainable housing. And that was things like not going out to the greenfield site three miles outside the town to do housing mm. developments, use of infills and brownfield sites, again, proximity to services, good planning with the health services and the heads of the states to make sure that services like primary and community care were located in close proximity to developments and where people live. So a lot of those high level uh, recommendations were made in the new national planning framework. And then in 2018, the two min uh, junior ministers for um, health and housing came together and said, okay, we needed to do a proper housing policy or with options for older people. So the fact that two departments came together at that level was very, very significant. We worked very closely with the department on the development of that policy. And in February of last year, um, the housing options for our aging population policy statement was published jointly by the two departments with 40 plus commitments mm. to delivering um, age-friendly housing and sustainable housing for the rest, for the, for across the country. So, um, Again, like that, an implementation group was set up, very strategic and, and high level, um, a mixture of the two departments, but also agencies like the approved housing sector, you know, the Irish Council for Social Housing, um, 
uh, I suppose people who are in the HSE and put, you know, uh, services, people like ourselves, but most importantly, they asked two members from our national network of older people's councils, two citizens to sit on that overarching group, which was really, really great. And through the, that group, we are implementing all the actions mm. around um, the housing developments, building in universal design, uh, making sure that all future developments are going to be built in an age-friendly way, making sure that our existing housing stock can be accessible, making sure that there's a range of options, that it's not just, you know, um, the modification of your own home. You might have bespoke age-friendly developments. You might have home sharing. You might have, um, I suppose, split houses. Um, there's a lovely mm. project going on in Dublin at the moment where um, old, uh, an older person has actually, um, it's called the Ava Housing Project. It's very exciting. And mm. they've actually split their house and the upstairs is uh, an apartment for, you know, a person or a young family. Mm -hmm. And the older person has remained in their own home, but downstairs in a small, yeah. smaller space. So a little bit of revenue from upstairs is feeding back the loan to do the conversion. And the person is able to live in their own home, their own mm -hmm. community, and not have to go anywhere without having all the worries of trying to heat a three-bedroom home, you know, maintain it and sustain it in older years. Sure. And it's a beautiful example of how we can be really, really innovative because that's one of our things when we went out to speak to older people. Let's be creative. Let's yeah. throw the rule book out and say, okay, policy mightn't allow us to do this, but if this is the challenge, what would your solutions be? And it's amazing how creative and innovative you can be when you throw away the rule book. Now, you might yeah. come back and say, actually, we can't do that, but we could do a version of that. So I think though that has been one of our, our really, really exciting ones. One that's actually we're working with at the moment um, and given your own background, Ira, you might be interested. Previously, in, in my previous career, I worked in telecare uh, and telehealth, telemedicine okay. and uh, chronic disease management, you know, remote chronic disease management. And I suppose it hasn't really lifted off here. I know we've got really good examples of it in the US, particularly with the veterans. Mm. And uh, there used to be a lovely one called the health buddy with, you know, clinical triage provided. And uh, but. Uh, we're working with an organization at the moment to try and um, help them scale up a program called XWELL, which is okay. a medical exercise program. And there are lots of different physical activity programs, which are fantastic. But this is more clinical based for, I suppose, two reasons. One, it has it has to be referred by a clinician. So yeah. maybe somebody has a chronic uh, condition that might be post-cardiac, um, that might be rehabilitating from you know, a hip replacement, or they have to have had some, I suppose, clinical incident, which is potentially causing them difficulty remaining in their own home. And then it's got clinical oversight. So there's somebody there, a clinician there to help, uh, I suppose, monitor um, you know, vital signs and make sure that they're improving. And it is, a really fantastic uh, uh, program. It rolls out four times a week. There's a number of different sites. People come in and uh, they take their exercise program. So probably be about 60 to 70 minutes of their physical activity program overseen by a clinician and supported by sports students. Mm. And then at the end of it, they have a cup of tea and a chat and uh, there's a real social element to it where sure. they actually sit down. And oftentimes in that lovely environment, and I would speak to this in droves where people sit down and they say, God, I didn't know that there was a book club on the library. I'd love to go to that. Or I didn't know that you could get the bus to uh, Beaumont Hospital. Where does it leave from? Uh, an awful lot of, I suppose, little nuggets of information transpire when people are having those conversations. So it provides an opportunity, which a lot of other projects do. But you'll find that they're very health orientated in that environment. And that um, XWELL program is, is rolling out in a number of sites, but I suppose their ambition is that they scale it up and scale it up so that to every you know, town, village in Ireland, that we will have this clinical exercise program that people can go to. Mm -hmm. And the rehabilitative effects of it are quite amazing, really, really amazing. And you've seen people come in there that, you know, on maybe, you know, post-cardiac, as I say, and not only their physical, they get nutrition advice and diet advice, but then they forge this network of friends as well, like a support network. And it's a really, really great program. And I suppose both it can be reactive and interventative, you know, and the, the more True. younger you go, um, the clinical programs that he's writing, uh, you're, the, you're the medical director of it, looking at uh, supporting people who are preparing for chemotherapy to get mm. well enough and get healthier enough to prepare for chemotherapy. So in some way, we'll probably move into being a preventative program as well. So um, I suppose 
what's the role of Age Friendly Ireland? Well, we would like to, I suppose, help facilitate that through the different structures that we network with, whether it's the provision of, you know, using existing leisure centres that are there. You don't have to go out and build a purpose-built environment to roll out these programmes. Utilise the resources that we have available at local level, you know, link in with education and training to identify students, you know, mm-hmm. sources of referrals and getting the health people on board. And I suppose one of our roles is we do facilitate and network and, and provide those connections to people right. that need to talk to each other. And uh, so that's, you, you had sort of said one that I'm excited about. I'm, I'm quite excited about the impact of what that can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a theme that we sort of we currently hear in terms of, you know, not, not just, of course, the, the use of, of these technologies and, and the, the e-health and, and digital health mm-hmm. and so forth, but this connectedness, uh, the fact that, you know, it is, it's so important uh, for all of us, but especially as we get older to have some connection to, to others, to, to the system. Uh, it's it's a, sort of an indispensable part of what makes us feel useful. Um, mm-hmm. in, in, in what's around us and, and giving us a reason just to live. <laughs> and it's a, it's, it's a very, and it's really elegant when I hear you talk about this and how you've really uh, designed uh, these systems and thought it through and sort of all the ways that um, the, the current structure uh, can be applied uh, to, to create these effects. And it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, you know, Going out a little bit now, I mean, obviously we talked um, about how sort of the WHO you know, looks at this 2020, 20, 2030 decade as sort of a decade of healthy aging. Um, you were uh, quoted uh, recently, I think it was in the, the, the Irish Times, um, it, it, was, it was an article about sort of the 2050 issues. And, you know, we, we, we talk about these 2050 numbers all the time in terms of the global numbers, in terms of uh, 2 billion plus 65 mm-hmm. plus year old, um, with 500 million octogenarians around the world. Uh, you know, you spoke in this uh, recent article you know, of, of potential 8 million people that are going to be in Ireland in 2050. It's 1.6 million over 65. Um, obviously, don't have a crystal ball on the table there, but take us out, obviously, to uh, say the end of the hell, the, the 2030 era, and then take us to that 2050 realm. What are some of the things that you're envisioning uh, moving forward because uh, obviously a lot happening uh, as this we thought this this demographic uh, uh, shift continues mm-hmm. I suppose I mean um, in effect if, if I'm asked to project on to 2050 and uh, what I'd like to see um, Ira I mean it's, it's great the population is growing and it's it's you know it's great that we have an aging population because years ago, I know, I mean, with the amount of changes that have happened, particularly in uh, people now have comorbidities, trimorbidities and and can live, you know, normal lives because they've had, I suppose, uh, responsive medication. And uh, but I suppose what I'd like to we'd like to get to is that if people are going to be living, particularly our children are going to be living to their well into their late 80s, 90s and, Mm -hmm. and hundreds, that we want them to have healthy longevity. Right. We don't want them to have to be sick and reliant on acute based services. And, you know, uh, because older people don't like to be a burden. They would hear that anecdotally all the time. That's their, their biggest fear and worry. And oftentimes will try to maintain independence really for as long as possible because they don't want to be a burden. And what we're actually seeing in Ireland, for example, is in, particularly in the last 10 years of austerity, older people have played such a significant role, come back to the family because they've had to support children to rear children, um, because you know money has been very tight, and uh, you know it's been a very very tough time financially on the country, and grandparents have played a significant role, and you know in helping to support families. Sure. But I think if we if we look forward to 2050, and you can look at countries like Japan at the minute that have you know the, the most aged population in the world, and look at what is it that they're doing. Right. that you know has has made it a really good environment for older people and you look at their diet and you look at their tra- uh, their nutrition and you look at the design of their country and they're doing it very well they also have things like you know um it's it's a warm country and not every country has that there's a lot of things that we can learn from those but for me um like in an irish context i would hope that age friendly will simply be it will mm-hmm. just exist we won't have to say we should be doing this in an age-friendly way. 
I hope that every service, you know, every, um, you know, whether it's a public service or a private service, every business, everything will be orientated towards being inclusive for all and not segregated. Oh, this is good for older people and this right. is good. It's good for everybody. And that's where the way our society should be. If we're going to have 8 million uh, people and, you know, 1.6 million are going to be over 65, that we have the services in place that are able to be responsive to the needs. And that's what I hope what we're doing now is going to inform those future leaders and future policymakers and future deliverers of services that they know now what it is that we need to be doing in order to make people happy and have good longevity. I think there's also, we, ne we can never forget that there's the citizen approach. You know, people have to be empowered to look after themselves. So particularly we would do an awful lot of intergenerational work, Ira. Mm -hmm. A lot of the older people would go out into schools and we have lovely knowledge transfer where they'll talk to children about cooking a healthy meal from scratch years ago and the children will teach them how to use their smartphone or Skype their children mm. in Australia. And those have happened in spades. And I think in some way, if it's given insight to children about what's important in longevity, you know, educating the children now about, you know, um, I suppose the good food and being able to have a good diet, the importance of physical activity, looking after your health, um, the social uh, part that we spoke about, social connectedness is mm -hmm. so, so important. And particularly for, you know, people with mental health issues and that have maybe, you know, whether they've got a clinical depression or if they've got anxieties or whatever the case, that having that link and that support and being able to talk to somebody is so, so important because there are so many countries that still have that kind of stigma attached to it's not it's it, it's not okay to be you know to not be okay we're right. trying to change that narrative to it is okay not to be okay and it's quite okay to talk so i think if we can educate the generation coming up that these are the key factors you know and of course smoke and cessation and alcohol and all those other things and the negative impact that that can have and i suppose when you're that age ira if you, if you think back to when you're that age you know <laughs> where are you thinking what like what a life when i was that age did i think that 50 was really old you know <laughs> and i'm two years off it myself and i'm thinking god when i was 15 i thought that was you know a, a really really old and it's only as you get older you realize god that's you know it's so young and in right. people uh, even now when you're talking about in ireland you know you moved out of home at 17 or 18 you went to university then you got your own flat and that whole landscape is changing in ireland uh, by a number of factors but you know uh, children are living at home longer with their parents and I sort of tend to say people say god you know the, the child's having a real difficulty getting on the property ladder which is everybody's right sure. but they're possibly going to live a lot longer than we will so you know it's even I'm hearing people saying about you know having children you used to have your children in your 20s a lot of people are having children now in their 30s and and late into their 30s early 40s yep. because they are going to be around. As long as they're healthy, they are going to be around. So I think there's real positives. We have a lot to look forward to. You know, a longer life expectancy, a healthier life expectancy if, if people do certain things and if the services are there to provide it. So I, I'm kind of a, a glass half full type of girl. I, I always try to look at the positives, Absolutely. you know, try to think this is something that we should be celebrating. And whilst I know at the minute we have huge challenges and we still have a lot to do, I think for future generations, what we're doing now is going to help them. Well, I hope it is anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and sort of this intergenerational thinking, uh, you know, this isn't a one-time thing. Um, and and uh, this, is, this is a trend that is not going to stop. And you know, we not only have to deal with it today, but we have to educate the young kids. And as you were mentioning, this, this crucial interaction between the elderly and the young uh, and, the, and the knowledge transfer, um, the things that we may normally lose in that context are just really, uh, you know, I, I love the way you talk about it, you're passionate about it, and, and it is so very important to, to look at this whole integrated process. This isn't uh, you know, just about uh, you know, this one set of buildings or this medicine here, but it's really about this integrated approach mm -hmm. that that, that spans uh, spans the generations, and, and and I really you know I really enjoy listening to you, to you talk about this. And I just you know as I said, sitting here in the U.S., wish we could find uh, models uh, like this or, or try to copy them at least on a, on a small level that uh, 
Uh, There's a great is. organization in the U.S. called AARP. Sure. And yeah, I, they, just, became, they, I just became a member at 50. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, just, hey, hey, I, was joking, I was joking with my wife. I was like, I don't know. Is, is there something wrong that I enjoy reading the AARP magazine? Uh, but I just went, whatever. I mean, yeah, it's, um, you know, there's an example. Right. Uh, I used to think yeah. the AARP used to come to my mother's apartment in her 80s. I was like, oh, I'm an old person magazine. Yeah. But I enjoy it. <laughs> it gives me a lot of interesting facts and, and concepts. But they're a great organization. And they're Absolutely. trying, I suppose, they have like that members of the WHO sure. and um, work very closely with, you know, I mean, there are a number of different members. You've got the International Federation on Aging as well, based in, in, in Canada. Right. They're holding a big conference this fall and work very closely with the WHO. We have a lot to learn from other countries as well, Ira, because in the U.S., I mean, there are certain things that are going on, maybe sporadically and maybe right. not as consistently, but there's really good models of practice. But I know AARP of a huge connectedness with citizens have a huge opportunity to share good practice with them. Yeah. So there is, there is good work going on, you know, and sure. I mean, Ireland is a small country, small population. We've made great strides. We did it in a period of, you know, severe austerity. And we're delighted with the work, but we're always very keen to learn, very keen to learn from others. Kevin, it's, it's been a delight having you, uh, you know, sharing your knowledge, uh, sharing your vision, and, and as we say on the show, inspiring the future. And, and, and you clearly do that and just, you know, listening to, uh, to you and what you've done. It's, it, it's, it's really amazing um, for, you know, everybody that's going to be watching this uh, on the YouTube channel or listening on the various podcast networks. Uh, we've been talking to Catherine McGuigan, uh, Chief County Officer at Meath County Council, uh, also uh, National Program Lead for Aid Friendly Ireland organization's goal, and then clearly doing it, making every county in Ireland a great place to grow old. And Catherine, thank you for what you do and, and taking the time to join us today and sharing your knowledge uh, and wishing you the best of luck moving it forward. And hopefully we can mimic a lot of what you're doing in Ireland here because we, we this is definitely uh, needed. Uh, the demographics are changing, it's coming, and mm -hmm. we all have to be prepared. So really thank you for, for everything you do. Thank you, Iris. Thank you very much for having me. It was my pleasure to get the opportunity to share and uh, delighted that we had such a good conversation. Thank you very much.